could tell It's gonna be a great Noel It's the Advent Calendar House Muffins, black and smurfs and even Garfield's Halloween We're gonna take a trip down memory lane Frosty, Rudolph, and a bunch you've probably never seen It's Mike and pals that come to entertain Turn the knob and lift the latch for fun and last we can't be matched so Just beware the icy patch, it's the Advent Calendar House Welcome back to the Advent Calendar House, the podcast that loves its goldfish and its crayon, too. All season long, I've been revisiting people and places we've covered before. And once again, I wish I could tell you how I got here, but we are back on Sesame Street for a fourth time. So join us as we fly faster than time backwards around the globe to 1996 as Elmo saves Christmas. I am reindeer in training who can enter the speed force, but I'm still working on that landing part, Mike Westfall. And joining me is someone who thought her deepest desire was a glass of water, but now she's wondering if she should have wished for a diet soda instead. Please welcome Becca Petunia from toughpigs.com. Hi, Becca. Hi, it's so good to be here, Mike. Thank you so much. Listen, I'm, I'm so glad to be here, but I'm thinking, thinking I should have gone with that pink bear. Oh, it's always a tough decision. And live from his grandmother's in Cincinnati, where he's stuck waiting for a tomorrow that seems like it'll never arrive. Please welcome Anthony Strand, also from toughpigs.com. Hello, Anthony. Hello, Mike. Thank you. Well, here's the thing. I can read that letter from Big Bird when I get back, if I get back, if I can learn to read. <laughs> so thank you so much. Step one, learn to read. Yep, yep. Thank you both so much for being here. I've been reading Tough Pigs for, oh, it's been over 20 years now, so I'm very excited to have you both here. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Neither yeah, of us yeah. has been with the site uh, quite that long, but right. we'll take credit. <laughs> sure. hey, hey, listen, listen. At this point, I just realized recently that I've been writing for Tough Pigs for nine years, and like that blows my mind. So you know what? I'm going to pretend that once you've hit once you hit a decade, I feel like then you can pretend that, you know, I might as well have founded the site. Take all the credit you want. <laughs> sure, sure. Wow, Danny Horn is here. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I yeah, I started writing for Tough Pigs in 2007. So this is 16 years for me, which wow. is a lot. <laughs> feels like a very large chunk of my life. But I've never been on a podcast talking about a Sesame Street Christmas special before. So this is this is new. Oh, well, I'm honored. I have, but um, you know what? Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on a podcast talking about a Christ Sesame Street Christmas special. Always mm -hmm. a good time. Well, let me start with talking about your own histories of watching this particular special. And we will start with you, Becca. So I was just saying, so I'm a little younger than Mike and Anthony. Um, so I was five when this special came out and... I was big into Sesame Street at the time, but at the same time, I don't actually remember having seen this special until much later. I I don't, well, Sesame Street, 1996 era Sesame Street was a big part of my childhood. I had like no memory of this special and I rewatched it, you know, when I was older, once I started working for Tough Pigs and all of those things, but it weirdly wasn't a part of my childhood in, in the same way as, you know, some of the Muppet Christmas specials like Muppet Family Christmas and Muppet Muppet Christmas Carol. So I don't know. But and Mr. Willoughby's Christmas tree. Yeah, Willoughby's mm -hmm. Christmas tree. Yeah. And um, the Christmas toy and Bratz of the Lost Nebula. Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gotten to that one yet. Yeah, no kidding. It's, well, it's not a Christmas special. It's it's, I wish there was a Bratz of the Lost Nebula Christmas special. <laughs> um, is it my turn? Yeah, sure, Anthony. Okay, uh, so I was 11 when this came out. And I have such a distinct memory. We, we were PBS members. Mm -hmm. And so we got the programming guide in the mail every year. My my entire childhood. Every month, my entire childhood. I still do. I'm still a PBS member to this Nice. Time. And I have such a distinct memory of the PBS programming guide arriving which had Elmo and Charles Durning on the front oh. uh, for this special. 
Charles Durning as Santa. Yeah. And because, you know, because it was a big Christmas special and it was airing in prime time, you know, unusually for Sesame Street, of course. And I remember being so excited because I was a little too old for Sesame Street, quote unquote, too old. No, yeah, well, uh, but I still watched it all the time. Because I've, I've, you know, I was a Muppet fan. I always, I mean, like I said, I've been writing for Tough Pigs for 16 years. Yeah, I didn't go through a phase where I wasn't watching Sesame Street. Um, but my little brother was six; he was five years younger than me. So we were both very excited, and I was especially excited because Doc Hopper was playing Santa Claus. Yes. Santa. You know, like I was, I was old enough to like see the picture, be like, "Wow, that Santa is going to offer me some frog legs." You know. <laughs> was part of it and i and i watched it uh on tv that year and i loved it and i bought the tape myself with paper out money oh wow probably the next year maybe maybe in eighth grade <laughs> like I mean, it was a couple of years later maybe but yeah and i've, I've watched it almost every year since okay I, I really enjoy it it had been a while since i had sat down and watched it but i remember watching this at some point in the late 90s but I'm not entirely certain when. There's a good chance it wasn't even close to Christmas when I did. So when I was growing up, my mom provided daycare for several kids in our home. And one kid loved watching Christmas tapes no matter what time of year it was. Middle of summer. Can we watch Muppet Family Christmas tape? Shout out to Sam. That was almost always their first pick. But I think Elmo Saves Christmas might have been another one. I watched with them, which I was 16 at the time. So probably the only time I would have watched this was with the toddler who wants to watch it in the middle of the summer. Sure. But Elmo Saves Christmas first aired in prime time on December 2nd, 1996. That's according to Wikipedia and other websites that clearly just copied Wikipedia, but fine. And Becca, you reminded me before we started recording, this was during the height of Tickle Me Elmo. Yeah, so so it's so important to remember that 1996 was the year of Elmo and really the start of Elmo's reign on Sesame Street. Like, he was a big deal on the show and had been a big deal on the show since the 80s, mm -hmm. but... This was like the moment where Elmo absolutely became the main character of Sesame Street. You know, Elmo's world never happens without the Tickle Me Elmo doll. And, right. you know, Elmo in Grouchland never happens without the Tickle Me Elmo doll. And this really ties in with the Tickle Me Elmo doll in a weird way, even though it obviously doesn't explicitly say like, by Tickle Me Elmo, but you got to <laughs> figure that there are kids who saw this and then like got a Tickle Me Elmo doll, you know, three weeks later for Christmas. Right. Because because Christmas was really when it blew up too. Tickle Me yeah. Elmo. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, like, yeah, it was the big toy of that Christmas or whatever. So I think that this is the first Sesame Street Christmas special in 18 years. Wow, you're right. I don't know if we, we want to talk about that. There were there were two in 1978. Yes, and I've covered both. Sure, sure, sure. Ooh, even so, the bad so one, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So as you know, the, the brilliant and heartwarming Christmas Eve on Sesame Street and the absolutely bonkers a special <laughs> Sesame Street Christmas. <laughs> and and then after that, they didn't do another one. PBS ran Christmas Eve on Sesame Street every year. No one ran a special Sesame Street Christmas. Nope. You know, like it, it, it was never released on home video until the DVD in about 2012 or something. But Christmas Eve on Sesame Street, which is a perfect example of Sesame Street at its peak in 1978. Oh, yeah. Right. It's all this humans and the Muppets. There's no animations in it. There's no cutaways about animals or whatever. Uh, and, and, and I like all that stuff fine. But there's something so nice about having a whole hour, as this is also, mm -hmm. of just like the people and the Muppets that we love from Sesame Street. And so they didn't need to make another one because they could run this every year. And then I think by the mid 90s, it was like, well, Gordon and Maria don't look like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Who both certainly aged very well. I'm not not oh, yeah. them, but I think even by the time I was a kid in the early 90s, it was like. I knew it wasn't new, you know? And I think more importantly, 
Elmo wasn't there. No, Elmo's not, not in at all. It, right. Yeah. yeah, Elmo's not in Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. Nope. Not even in the background, right. like in Follow That Bird, where he peeks his head out of a window <laughs> <Right>. for <laughs> two seconds. Right. Well, it, it, and it's it's before the Elmo puppet even made its debut, which I think was season twelve. Yeah. So that and that special came out in the middle of season ten. And let a, let alone the for your audience who doesn't may not know. That Elmo puppet, when it debuted, looked the same, but had a rotating cycle of performers and gimmicks. Um, right, it was, know, just a, it was just a monster, basically. It was just a monster, yeah. and yeah. then it was a Muppet named Elmo with a really weird voice. Muppet Wiki has unearthed and posted a couple clips, but the gimmick with Elmo was, it used to talk. Play, play, fun, help. <laughs> <laughs> like that that was there are clips yeah. that our friend scott at muppet wiki has unearthed and posted uh-oh elmo squeaked balloon too hard <laughs> elmo wasn't fun until kevin clash really took over in 1984 and at that point i think the idea of just constantly rerunning christmas eve on sesame street a special that has no elmo just wouldn't fly the same way no that's a very good point right. yeah you can run it i mean i've watched it probably every year of my life but <laughs> yeah it, it rules i mean it's it's wonderful yeah absolutely but i mean that's a lot of personal nostalgia that goes along with it it's the memories of watching the old tape that my mom later copied onto a dvd and sent to me so uh -uh. There's, there's a lot attached to that but if you're a kid in the 90s and you're looking for Elmo in this and he's not around, you're wondering a lot of questions about this. Where's Luis? Who's this guy Maria's hanging out with? Because by the <laughs> mid 90s, Northern Galloway wasn't even with us anymore. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was time for for the target audience. I understand why this exists. Yeah. And so I think so. Let, let, let me say up front, then I think it's very fortunate and kind of a miracle that this special is as good as it is yeah because i i don't think it's quite as good as, as christmas eve on sesame street but it's very funny it has some some fun musical performances and it shows what the show was really good at at that time in the 90s in the same way that the that the earlier special does for the 70s i think you know like it it's kind of just a display of, of what was good about Sesame Street at the time with very little of the bad. Yeah, it is, it is a very impressive feat that it holds up just so well. And well, why don't we just get right on into it? So we open on a little gathering in an apartment with a couple of kids, a handful of Muppets that we recognize and our very special guest star and narrator, Maya Angelou. Didn't Elmo ever tell you the story about the time he saved Christmas? And then almost lost it again. What? It's so funny because as I was about to, as I was about to sit down to put this on, um, I actually watched it shortly before recording this. Um, mm -hmm. And I was talking to my fiance and I was like, the thing that you need to know about Almost Saves Christmas is it has a very special narrator. <laughs> and my fiance goes, what character is it? I said, no, 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 no. It's not a character. And my fiance goes, so it's a celebrity? Is it Mandy Patankin? And I was like, <laughs> oh, man, stop <laughs> guessing, because you are never going to guess <laughs> who the narrator of <laughs> Elmo Saves Christmas is. No, no one. There's no there's no way to guess. Absolutely not. But what a get. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, so she had been on Sesame Street before, sure. right? Like this is this is not her first appearance on Sesame Street. She had to have been. She was on. I think she was actually on a couple times. But, you know, like Anthony was saying, I think that this is a great example of like, like Anthony said, what the show was good at doing. Mm -hmm. Um, Where in the 90s, they were knocking it out of the park with with guest stars. Like, I feel like 90s Sesame Street had arguably like, even more impressive guest stars than like in the the earlier earlier days like that was when they were getting like presidents and first ladies mm -hmm. on and things like that yeah it's 
it's it, it's funny because you 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 say presidents and first ladies, which is true. But my mind went immediately to Patrick Stewart doing mm. a B <laughs> or not a B. I mean, <laughs> look, like, The Simpsons were guest yeah, stars on yes, Sesame Street yes. in this era. Yeah. yeah. So it looks like Maya Angelou did a lot on Sesame Street. I've got Muppet Wiki up in the other window. Yeah, I see pictures of her with Baby Natasha, Harry Monster. Yeah, she's in at least yes. she's in at least seven episodes. Oh wow, I wouldn't have guessed seven. Although it's very likely that she shot many inserts on the same day. That makes you know, sense, yeah. They debuted in different episodes. She's wearing only two outfits between the seven episodes. Well, so there I it gotta is. assume it was <laughs> Yeah. It was, it was probably two days or maybe even one. Yeah. Sure. But a very productive couple of days. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And before this, like my first exposure to Maya Angelou was her at President Clinton's inauguration. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I remember watching it in school and just being really enamored with her presence and her speaking voice. She really commanded my yeah. attention. So she's a perfect pick for a narrator. Yeah, amazing voice. Truly amazing. It also is important to note, and again, I believe me, we might be tough pigs, but I didn't have this memorized. But it's important to note that uh, in 1996, same year as this, Maya Angelou also contributed a recipe uh, to Miss Piggy's cookbook. <laughs> Did she? Oh, wow. Yeah. Which I own, by the way. I have a copy of upstairs. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It was a busy 1996 for the Muppets, for Maya Angelou. Mm -hmm. Everybody's banging on all cylinders in 96. <laughs> but no, so so it sets up this framing device, right, where Maya Angelou is telling the kids and the Muppets the story of when Elmo saved Christmas. And again, it's so interesting to me because... Those Muppets are like almost three best friends. Right. Zoe, Telly, and Baby Bear, who apparently are not aware that this happened. Well, and, and Maya Angelou actually says, didn't Elmo ever tell you about the year that he almost destroyed Christmas and then saved it again or whatever it is? Like, yeah. she is explicitly framing this as a thing that happened to Elmo a long time ago. That he could have told them of, right? It's she says, didn't Elmo ever tell you? You know? But you know, again, almost three and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Telly, Telly is older, both as a character and like Telly has been on the show longer than Elmo. Yes. And is supposed to be older than Elmo. Like Telly is clearly like a young, you know what I mean? Like six or seven. Like, yeah. Well, Telly's one of those characters who sometimes seems six or seven and sometimes seems 48. Yes. You know, like, <laughs> depending, depending on the sketch. He definitely doesn't seem younger than Elmo. No, 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 no. Never. No, heavens no. Well, and actually, Telly, this if, this scene has one of my favorite Telly moments, which, which I, I kind of think Telly's secretly one of the MVPs of this special. But yes. Uh, but this scene has Baby Bear because baby bear is not a character with a lot to to contribute if we're being honest but baby bear starts out by singing poage roasting on an open fire <laughs> yes. right beautifully and right yes but then telly says oh chestnuts too and i right. love the that like right up front <laughs> telly's like we're not abandoning tradition we're doing no. chestnuts right <laughs> you know and that is kind of actually kind of sets up what this whole special is about because much of the special is about mindlessly following Christmas traditions. Yeah. And uh, Telly kind of kind of tips that off right up front. So I enjoy that. Well, to be fair, Baby Bear also comes from an interfaith household. He also <laughs> celebrates Hanukkah. It's true. That's true. Yeah. As we'll find out six years later in Elmo's World Happy Holidays. OK, I wasn't sure whether that was <laughs> no. known by this point or if it was uh, revealed mm, later yet. that okay. I guarantee and I guarantee that was not on David Rudman's mind. Like, oh, no. Oh, David Rudman always played Baby Bear as it. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I will get to that because I, mean, I do. I do nope. want to. Uh, yeah, that's not one of the ones I covered. Well, listen, that has. And we won't get into it, but that is one of my all-time favorite sketches, which is, of course, Prairie the Dawn nativity? does the nativity scene. Yeah. And you just sit there the whole time and you're like, oh, they're doing this. <laughs> they sure are. They're doing this. Mm -hmm. 
but that's a story for another day. Tonight, yes. everyone's <laughs> excited about Christmas. Telly proclaims he wishes it could be Christmas every day, and the others quickly agree until Maya says, didn't Elmo ever tell you the story <laughs> about the time he saved Christmas and then almost lost it again? Which surprises me because... Elmo seems like the type who would love to tell this story to anyone who would listen to him. <laughs> right. He's not really known for being secretive. No, no. But Maya prepares her now captive audience for what she calls a very Christmassy story that all started on a Christmas Eve on Sesame Street, but not that Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. I wish she said that. I wish she said it. Yeah. She's like, oh, I the, wish. She's like the gang was not <laughs> ice skating. No. <laughs> <laughs> no whip cracking this time. Uh, right. But because it's the mid 90s, we fade to a very specific portion of Sesame Street known as Around the Corner. Let let the record show that Becca is pumping her fists right she now. She sure is. I again. So this is my era of Sesame Street. Again, for, for those those in your audience who aren't, you know, 32 and obsessed with the Muppets. Around the Corner was an attempt in the early 90s to increase the size of the set of Sesame Street and the amount of characters. Mm -hmm. You know, Sesame Street, we think of, you know, Hooper's Store and Big Bird's Nest and the little play area and, you know, the stoop and, and Oscar's can. But in the early 90s, they were like, what if what if there was more to Sesame Street? And what if those things were a daycare center? a dance studio, a antique Wonder store Man. run by, run by Ruth Buzzy. <laughs> oh, right. And don't, please don't forget finders keepers and no. a posh hotel, the furry arms. Yes. Which none of maybe the daycare center and the dance studio, but certainly like the other two don't really feel like they belong on Sesame street. They added like a million other characters the only one of which who stuck was Zoe. Um, you know, again, I could name like Humphrey and Ingrid and Joey and Davy Monkey and yep. Sherry Netherland and Benny Rabbit. And they're all in this special. All those characters are there. Yeah, they're all hanging out in the background. Right. Ro you, Roxy Marie, I don't think you said. That's another. Oh, that was another. True. Kingston, true. Kingston living in the third. Like there were so many. Yeah, I saw there Kingston. Were so many. And again, they did not stick around. I'm sure most of your audience has no idea who I'm talking about with any of these, except Zoe, again. Yeah, probably not, yeah. Although I think they were both uh, introduced right before this, but like Rosita and Baby Bear feel like they're from that era to me. They yeah. are. Who yeah. stuck around? Rosita was shortly before, as was Baby Bear, but yes, they, yeah. they feel of that time. It was mm -hmm. shortly, shortly before. Right. So anyways, yeah, here here we are around the corner. Just the place to spend Christmas at the Sherry yeah. Netherland Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> or at the Furry Arms Hotel. I mean. Yeah, sure. With Sherry. Uh, and there are some some classic better known characters from my era of Sesame Street. The first <laughs> one we see is one of my favorite Muppets as a kid, Harry Monster. Just throwing snow in the background. Yeah, that. That's one thing that is nice. Um, a lot of those like classic characters don't get really like moments to shine in this special, but it is nice to see that they're there, you know, like Harry Monster yes. and, you know, again, my girl Prairie and, yep. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, even even forgetful Jones in the credits, who, again, does not say <laughs> anything, but he's featured pretty prominently. In the yeah, credits. just walks right by. <laughs> yeah. The first shot we see of Elmo, forgetful Jones walks right in front of him. Sure. So he can't <laughs> even see Elmo. But we pan down the around the corner portion and back to the more familiar side of the street as we see a whole bunch of people walking about carrying wrapped packages. It's the hustle and bustle of the holiday season. As we're treated to a song called It's Christmas Again, led by our old pal Bob. Hang star upon the tree. It's Christmas again. Good to see and hear Bob again, y'all. Right. So so everyone who isn't Bob in this group is uh, 14 Carat Soul, right? Or, or I don't remember. Are, are there other... Are there uh, other Gina like, is there. Gina's not there. And stuff. Gina's Gina there, is there. Yeah. There's others in this one, yeah. And a couple of kids, but okay, yeah. Later on, it's just Bob yeah. and fourteen carat soul. Yeah, um, who were at, who were an acapella group who were active at the time, still are active, I think. Are they? But 
like Maya Angelou, made many appearances on Sesame Street at this time for right. Carrot Soul. Yeah. Yes, I remember one. They had a whole song about what's down below the street in the in the underground. Right. That's what I was just gonna say. That's the one that was on all the time. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> it's it, it like sticks them in an animated like yes pipes and subways and all that. Yeah. Right. Love it. But I think they're a nice addition here. Like they sound great. Obviously, they're talented. Oh, it's great. They're perfect. And it's a unique sound. It's it's an unusual sound compared to what we usually get on Sesame Street. Yeah, and it's great to have them paired up with Bob. Yeah. And they'll show up a few more times. But here we see Elmo after Forgetful Jones walks by him. He's in front of Hooper's store saying thank you to Mr. Hanford, who is still here in 96. Yeah, a couple more years after this. Yeah. We don't see a lot of him in this special either, but nice to see him again. And Elmo's on his way home with a very large plate stacked with Christmas cookies for Santa. I sure hope the first person Elmo walks past on his way home (laughs) while holding a large plate stacked with cookies isn't some kind of noted cookie enthusiast. Oh, no, it is. (laughs) Who is that strange blue creature? That's my question. Uh, my kind of fella. My kind of <laughs> well go. done. I knew you. I knew. Yeah, I no, knew of course. Of course. If I set you up, you'd knock immediately, it down you immediately. Thank but. you for that. Mm-hmm. So Cookie Monster offers to lighten Elmo's load by taking just one or two cookies off his plate. But Elmo very insistently tells him, no, these cookies are for Santa Claus. And Cookie, of course, understands. So he leaves. For half a second, and then emerges with a Santa hatted beard. Yeah, that's great. I love this part. I I love. There's a certain, you know. So this is still Frank Oz's Cookie Monster. At yes, this point, correct. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. And and Grover and Bert yeah. doesn't say anything. Yeah, but no, Bert has no lines in the special. Um, but it's so good. And there was this thing again in a lot of like older than this Sesame Street. Like again, more in like the seventies where Cookie Monster was very, like, mischievous, playing, like, (laughs) tricks on people to get their cookies. And I loved seeing this get, that this, this Cookie Monster come back. And I also just love the line where he explains that the reason he's on the street now is Santa, it's like me doing a matinee today. I loved that. Loved that. Loved that. (laughs) Ho, 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 ho. Aha, me Santa Claus. Me come for cookies. Be doing matinee today. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, t- talking about mischievous cookie monster, that reminds me, there's a sketch uh, in, from the 70s where like Bert had this plate of cookies and he's yelling at Ernie for eating it. And then cookie monster walks out dressed as Ernie. <laughs> and he's like wearing like Ernie's um, shirt and also has like an Ernie wig on. Huh. And I think I think about that sketch all the time. <laughs> First thing that came to my mind when you talked about mischievous cookie monster is, of course, the great cookie thief. Yes. Which I yes. think I've talked about on this oh, show. The book, the book, the, well, the book sketch. and there was, was a, a sketch. sketch as well. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they, they made a little golden book out of that sketch, which I had, too. So, yes, I'm familiar with that. But. Oh, look at that. There he is. Oh, wow. <laughs> Anthony has changed his background to Cookie Monster in the urn. He, oh, he looks he looks thin because of the uh, the turtleneck. Yeah, because of the shirt. Yeah. 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 Anyways, that's amazing. I'm going to put that in the show notes. Yeah, I love it. I love it so much. The thing also about Cookie Monster that's so funny that Frank Oz does so well, not to say that, you know, um, David Redman, his current performer, doesn't do well, but like. I love it when Cookie Monster just uses big words like Matt like <laughs> or like here after Elmo obviously sees through his disguise. Yeah. He's like, oh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Like, I love it. when yeah. Cookie yes. Monster Because like, it's so easy. You know, he's such a feral creature some of the time. <laughs> he but is. then when he says things like nothing ventured, nothing gained, it's always funny. That's, yeah, he accepts mm-hmm. his defeat very admirably. So our next stop is Big Bird's Nest, where he's saying goodbye to his best friend, Mr. Snuffleupagus, who is wearing the greatest giant Christmas hat. That hat is like this, like, uh, I don't know how you, how you describe it. It's like a Swiss. 
like a Swiss mountaineer. Yeah, it's like an alpine hat. An alpine yeah. hat is what I have written. Yeah. And it's giant, of course, because Snuffy's head is huge. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not big on him. It's big on everyone else. But yeah, it, it's it's normal size on Snuffy. Sure. Complete with giant holly leaves and berries. Yeah, it's so good. I love it. Now I kind of want to get an alpine Christmas hat. I kind of want to get that one and just use it instead of a Christmas tree. <laughs> there you go. But Big Bird is sad to see Snuffy is leaving to visit his granny in Cincinnati. <laughs> and Big Bird immediately asks, You mean, this is goodbye? Yes, Bird. Goodbye. And they both get very emotional for about a minute. Until Snuffy remembers, Oh, I'm only going for Christmas and I'll be back the next day. So Snuffy lives in a cave. Yes. We know that. Mm -hmm. We already knew that by this time. And I wonder if his granny lives in a cave in Cincinnati, and I sure hope so. Cincinnati's got caves. Sure does, yeah. So it is Christmas Eve. Yes. And it's close to the end of, like, the day on Christmas Eve. Snuffy's leaving now, and he's going to be back on Boxing Day? Like, <laughs> He's taking a red eye. It's just Since, a quick trip to Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's that easy. No, I don't think so either. I mean, that's a long drive. They can't be driving. New York to Cincinnati is a little over 10 hours. Yeah, maybe they're walking. <laughs> so we're talking about a Christmas Eve flight that can accommodate a Snuffleupagus. That can't be cheap either. Uh, multiple. He's got a pres presumably three Snuffleupaguses at least. Yeah, his mother and Alice, I would I would think. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, it depends on it depends on if it's canon that he's divorced, that his mom's divorced. And that's very divorced. Yeah. <laughs> we also, during this opening segment, take a peek inside Santa's workshop for a verse. His elves are getting stuffed animals and other toys off a conveyor belt to wrap, it appears. So there are some more folks we'll meet a little later. But then the song ends with a big crowd putting the final touches on a tall tree in the middle of the central courtyard there. And then we cut to Elmo's apartment, where he finally puts the big plate of cookies for Santa in front of his fireplace, or he attempts to. He drops the whole plate because he's exhausted. Mm -hmm. But Elmo has already told us he wants to stay up late and actually see Santa, so he turns on the TV to watch It's a Wonderful Life. And I'm not even joking. On Elmo's little Elmo-sized TV, we see George Bailey meeting Clarence. So Sesame Street got permission to use this footage, and they use a lot of it. It shows up a lot. It's like a recurring theme. Yes. That, like, it's nice. I was going to say, it's actually one of my favorite things about this special. Because I grew up in very much an It's a Wonderful Life household. Okay. You know, like, we, my, it's my, my mom loves it. I mean, I love it, too. I, I'm sitting... 20 feet away from the poster in my basement. I have a big oh, poster wow. of George and Mary Bailey looking at each other. Nice. Um, you know, and all this stuff. So I love the movie still, but there's, even when I was a kid, it was just like the fact that that's what they were watching, not a Christmas special, not like a children's movie, you know, or something. Right. I don't know. Just here's all these specific jokes about it's a wonderful life, a movie that was already 50 years old. Yeah. It was made. I love it. And I guess his parents didn't have a problem with letting Elmo attempt to stay up late on Christmas Eve and watch TV. Yeah. But then I looked it up and Muppet Wiki tells us we don't even see Elmo's parents on Sesame Street until 10 years after this special. That surprised yeah. me. Right. Well, back in those days, the Sesame Street humans were the only parents that Muppets had on Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. You know, like like they would talk about Granny Bird or whatever, but. Like, who's Big Bird's parents? It's Gordon and Maria and Luis and yeah. Susan and Bob. You, you know, like... I mean, and that's that's literally what Follow That Bird is about. So. Yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and so, like, that's actually one of my... We, can, we, we could talk all day about some of the problems with modern Sesame stuff. And believe me, Anthony and I tend to. <laughs> we sure do. Um, but one of the things that I, that I find least appealing is how all the Muppets have parents now. So they talk to their Muppet parents about all these things that like that should be what Alan and and Chris and yeah. and um, Nina are doing, you know? Yeah, I miss that. Yeah, it's 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 an unfortunate choice, I think, because that's part of the appeal of 
Sesame Street is you just you have all these human parents who are always like there to give you advice and be mildly exasperated with you. You know, and I think though the other explanation that we can use, of course, and again, your audience might not know this, but we have to assume that at this point, Elmo's dad was overseas. Oh, that's uh, true. Protecting our freedom because uh, Elmo's dad is canonically a veteran. Yes. Didn't think about that part. Good, good call. A fact that I find very weird because then you have to think about like this furry red monster <laughs> in like the Gulf War or something. Oh, no. Right. This, this, and to to be clear, a furry red monster who sounds like Bing Crosby. Correct. Yes! <laughs> Correct. Just like in in military uniform, <laughs> being like, "Well, hey, everyone, I don't know. <laughs> We're in the trenches." You know, like, <laughs> yeah. It was strange. <laughs> Just write him into White Christmas. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. Remake White Christmas with with, with, with Elmo's Elmo dad, dad Louis, oh. <laughs> and the and, and the Danny K role can be I don't know Grover. <laughs> <laughs> that that works actually. Rosie, Rosita's dad was overseas. Oh, Rosita's dad oh, can right. be the Danny K. There you go. He and Louis were 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 in the same platoon. And yeah, of course, Rosita's dad was injured in the war and is now wheelchair bound. This is all literally things the show has dealt with. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mostly, mostly in like special videos though, right? This is yes. like, this is sure, yeah. like stuff from like videos for military families or whatever. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes. But you know, yeah, but it's all canon. Still yeah, counts. absolutely. Mm-hmm. counts. So Elmo gets to stay up late and I'm looking at the clock on the wall. First off, it's already 11 o'clock. That's late for me on Christmas Eve, and I'm a parent. (laughs) Secondly, I got excited about that clock specifically because I believe my parents still have that exact model clock or one very close to it. Oh, nice. So Elmo's trying to stay awake. I'm sure they're going to try and pull the same thing they did with Big Bird freezing on the roof and completely missing Santa's arrival. But no, Elmo wakes up. It's 1.30 now. And he hears something, looks over to find Santa's legs dangling from inside his fireplace, which, by the way, is one of the biggest New York apartment fireplaces I have ever seen. Well, they sure. talk about that because then they cut back to Maya Angelou and our, our other Muppet friends. And Zoe's like, I have a chimney. And Baby Bear is like, hmm. They always have, have radiators, radiators. <laughs> yes. which is kind of funny. It's pretty good. No, they all have radiators. Right. When I when I lived in Manhattan, I did not have a chimney. But Elmo wakes up. The TV that was playing It's a Wonderful Life is now snowing static because kids late at night, TV stations used to just stop showing things. They would end their broadcast day and then nothing for a few hours until about five. Mm-hmm. And Santa's stuck in the chimney, so Elmo helps pull him out, first one of his boots and then the rest of him. And as we mentioned, Santa Claus is played by Charles Durning, best known to us as Doc Hopper from the Muppet movie. I got me as a toy to deliver and I get stuck in the chimney. Uh-oh. You know how long I've been going down chimneys? No! Just before you were born. Oh. And I never get stuck. Never. So here's the weird thing about Charles Durning is that he played Santa Claus twice in 1996. Yes, he on did. Television. I have that note. What's the other one, Anthony? The other one is Mrs. Santa Claus, starring the great Angela Lansbury as the title character, and to a lesser extent, Charles Durning as her grumpy husband, <laughs> Santa Claus. Her, her grumpy husband, Santa. Yeah, he's like a real, like, he's like a real cranky Santa. Oh, yeah. And that's why, like, he's been, he, like, doesn't pay her any attention. So she's like, well, I guess I'm going to have to go be a Santa as well. Right. And, and that's that's what it's about. My grandma loved it. Oh, did that's she? My, my grandma is a big Murder, Cheryl fan. Oh, that She enjoyed do that movie yeah. thoroughly. Yeah. It's really sweet. Well, I was just going to say that that movie was actually written by uh, Mark Saltzman, who also wrote for Sesame Street for many, many years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Charles Durning is a real fun Santa Claus, though, because he he's this like level of like grump in this that. Yeah, I find really endearing. He's not always that comfortable. I feel like the beard is not doing him any favors. It like does not move. Santa's mouth doesn't move when he talks. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, 
And he does, I mean, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but that wink he does at the end oh my is like, goodness. just, 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 just don't. Just don't. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's such a, like, he's such a cranky Santa. I don't know. There's something about him and I don't know where Charles Durning is from, but he's a very New York Santa. <laughs> yeah, that's a good adjective to use here. I didn't think grouchy was the right word. Charles Durning was born in Highland Falls, New York. Oh. Okay, so I can call him a New York Santa. You sure can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like it is. I don't know if down to earth is the phrase I'm looking for, but he doesn't have that over the top. I'm Santa Claus. Have you been good this year? And I like that about this portrayal of Santa. It reminded me a little bit of, of Ed Asner's Santa in Elf. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think that in a special star in Elmo, like you, you want that. Yes. I think there's a version of this that's like much more cloying where Santa is that like, well, we can, t- I mean, the, the Santa in almost world happy holidays is just like a very generic. Ho, ho, hello, little boy. Right. Kind of Santa, you know? And uh, it's better that this one is Charles Durning just being like, Oh boy, I'm tired. Yeah. What do you want? A magic snow globe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> like he shoots straight with Elmo. He tells him he got stuck in his chimney, which he claims never happens. But he adds his sack of toys seems bigger than it should be. So he opens it up to reveal an adorable Muppet reindeer named Lightning. Gee whiz, sir. I just wanted to ride in your sleigh to see how it feels. I know I'm going to pull it someday. And if a reindeer gets hurt tonight, I could fill in. I'm fast. I'm strong. You're young and you're grounded. Yes. Played by Joey Mazzarino, who was already the head writer of Sesame Street by this time. Maybe, Maybe not quite. That's a great question that I want to check. Um, yeah. To the internet. I was going to say, keep keep vamping, keep vamping. Well, he, Joey Mazzarino was the head writer of Sesame Street for many years. Okay. He's left the show and he played a lot of Muppet characters who all sound exactly like Snowball. Yes. Or Lightning. <laughs> I'm going to sound exactly lightning. like Lightning. I mean, he, plays, <laughs> he plays a Snowball in uh, Almost Christmas Countdown, who sounds exactly like this also. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've seen that one. Snowball. But he played Murray. He played Murray Monster on on Sesame Street. Mm-hmm. He played uh, Joey Monkey of Joey and Davey Monkey fame. He played um, Stinky the Stinkweed. Stinky was Horatio. where I was going to go. Stinkweed, Horatio, Horatio the, the Elephant, elephant. right? Oh yeah, and, Mary and, Monster, and, right? And every single one of these characters sounds exactly like this. They got the you same know, like, voice. <laughs> Bug. Yeah. Hey everybody, it's me, Murray. Bug in <laughs> Elmo, Elmo Grouchland. Yeah. And it's not that I find that voice unpleasant. I don't. I know some Muppet fans do. Um, no, I don't mind it at all. No, I yeah. I mean, he's a very talented performer and, mm-hmm. a, and a great writer and all that stuff. Nothing against Joey Mazzarino. But more than just about any other Muppet performer, like, he doesn't have a, a wide voice range. No. You, know, you, you, you always know it's him immediately because he's doing that same squeaky voice. <laughs> yeah. Anthony, he would not become head writer until uh, season 40. So oh, much wow. later than this. Oh, wow. 2009. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he was a, you know, he was a writer. He was a writer on the show at yeah. this time. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. And because uh, he, he started writing and, and performing around the same time, I think, right? In the early 90s? Yes. Uh, he actually, his, he got the job because of his, um, he wrote the Columbo skits was actually oh, okay. his first job. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. He wrote the Columbo sketches and performed Columbo was how he right. started. <laughs> right. And, and that, that pop culture parody stuff was kind of his trademark, right? Yes. Like, okay. So, so for your, for your listeners who again, aren't, you know, Anthony and I, uh, Columbo was literally what it sounds like. Oh yeah, he was a lamb who was a Peter Falk parody. Yep, um, that was a thing <laughs> that appeared multiple times. Yeah, it was a whole bit. So yes. it would uh, hit, hit. Were his the Law and Order sketches? Did they do more than one of those? Um, no, I, I think they I, did. You're talking about the, the the special letters unit thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I think they only did the one, but like. Okay. His, his era as as head writer was full of that stuff. There's oh, like yeah. a sketch about glee. There's a sketch about uh true blood called True Mud. Oh, you I know, didn't see um, that one. There's like a there's like an upside Downton Abbey sketch. <laughs> uh which which I think is actually one of well, there, there's a Mad Men and a Downton Abbey, which are like two of Frank Oz's last performances on Sesame Street are playing 
the the Don Draper character in the Mad Men sketch huh. and and the the Carson the Butler character in the Downton Abbey sketch. Oh wow. Uh uh I think because he like gets to co-star with Fran Brill and all of that. Oh, okay. so he just came to hang hang out with his friend. Sure. Know, but, but what a weird footnote. Yeah. Joey Mazzarino's trademark as the writer though was he loved doing these pop culture parodies. Okay. Which had always been part of Sesame Street to some degree, but sure. he really he was he was all in on that. He cranked it up. Yeah. Anyway, Lightning is cute, but Lightning, he does have to be here for plot reasons, but also I feel like he doesn't have to be here, <laughs> right. if that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, it does. Well, I think it's, I mean, I think it's one of those things where I feel like it's supposed to be to give Elmo someone to talk to out loud. Yes. But Elmo could talk out loud to himself. He does it all the time. And he does in the entire first half of the special. <laughs> yeah, he does. Where he's like, Elmo is bringing this plate of cookies to Santa, or right. Elmo really hopes Elmo can see Santa tonight. So yep. you don't necessarily need it. No, it's just someone to talk to, mode of transportation. I was just going to say that he needs to explain to Elmo that how time travel works. Sure. So cause El- Elmo wouldn't know that. So anyways, t- tell us more about Lightning. So Lightning is a young reindeer in training who stowed away in Santa's bag because he knew he was training to pull the sleigh someday, so he wanted to see what it was like. What I want to know is, if Lightning snuck into the bag at the North Pole, how come Santa didn't get stuck in any chimneys until he was about two-thirds of the way around the world? He started at Elmo's house. It's weird. He he, (laughs) first stop. He flew all the way from the North Pole to Manhattan, skipped over Canada and the northern United States, (laughs) <laughs> specifically went to Elmo's Manhattan apartment. Didn't go to any of the other any of the other apartments nope. in that building. Just skipped the entire eastern point of the world. Wait until 1.30. Wait until 1.30. There's always that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether it's Andy Williams saying just exactly at 12 o'clock, which makes me think, oh, Santa arrives at midnight. That's canon. Apparently not. <laughs> sure. Or he's been stuck up there for an hour and a half. <laughs> That song, which is the which is the Happy Holidays slash the Holiday Season, by yep. Williams, has one of the greatest lyrics in the history of popular song, in my opinion, which is "Hoop de doo and dickery and, 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 doc. <laughs> and don't forget <laughs> to hang up your sock." <laughs> Love that song. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> oh yeah. Anyways, Christmas Christmas <laughs> songs are fun. <laughs> they sure are. I don't know why the sack is ever an issue. It clearly works like a TARDIS, but whenever Lightning is doing while hiding out in there, he must have jostled himself loose and got Santa stuck in Elmo's chimney. So Santa lets Lightning know he'd have been stuck there all night, and Lightning would have ruined Christmas if Elmo hadn't saved him. Santa then turns to Elmo, calls him a furry little hero for pulling him out of there and saving Christmas. So in gratitude, Santa lets Elmo choose one of two presents, either a pink teddy bear or a magical snow globe. And at first, Elmo wants to pick the bear. It's a very nice bear. But then Santa notes that the snow globe comes with three wishes. So of course, Elmo chooses that one. It's a no brainer. Yeah, you got to get the three wishes. So to make a wish, all Elmo has to do is shake the snow globe and say Blitzen, which I will note comes from the German word for lightning. So that's neat. Yeah, I was thinking oh. about that. I was like, that's yeah. that's the name of the reindeer. Yeah. And Elmo's first wish is for a glass of water because he's thirsty. Favorite scene in the movie. It's great. It, or special, special. He he wishes for a glass of water. And Santa is like, why'd you wish for a glass of water? And Elmo goes, I'm thirst, er, almost thirsty. And Santa says, you could wish for anything. And Elmo goes, like a A diet diet soda? soda? (laughs) And that is, that is, that's my favorite, my favorite kind of Muppet joke. (laughs) Did not peg Elmo as a diet soda drinker, but (laughs) he does later tell Santa, Elmo's mommy says, if you eat too many cookies, you could get fat. Yeah, I didn't love that. No. They would not have done that today. Nope. No. So, so speaking as a fatty. I don't mind it. It's okay. (laughs) But it also means we get treated to one of my favorite practical effects, a Muppet drinking from a straw. Yeah. And if you want to know how that works, we already told you Elmo was thirsty. Yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. So Elmo has two wishes. Two wishes left. Santa says, don't waste them. Well, he's going to. (laughs) Spoiler alert, kids. (laughs) 
<laughs> he and Lightning head back up the chimney, but not before Santa helps himself to Elmo's big plate of cookies. And that is how Elmo saved Christmas. Well, if people want to find you to... Oh, wait. The special does have that same fake out. It's Telly who says, and that's how Elmo, Elmo saved, saved Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> yeah. But Maya Angelou corrects them. That's not the end of the story. It's just the beginning. This scene has another one of my favorite telly lines. Go ahead. Maya Angelou asks them all what they would wish for, right? That's that's here. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And telly says some some kind of special pogo stick. It's like pogo stick with supercharged bouncing or something. Yes, some kind of pogo stick. Right. And then he shrugs and says, or world, or world peace. peace. <laughs> Which is like such a funny line delivery from Marty Robinson, I think. Yes. The other great thing in that is just how uh, how how Fran Brill pronounces bracelets when Zoe says it. Bracelets. Zoe's like, mm. I, I would wish, wish for, for more, more bracelets. bracelets. And I'm like, yeah, that's very Zoe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of my daughters absolutely used to say bracelet. So that reminded me of her when she was younger. Awesome. So now we cut to Christmas morning. I wonder how much detail Maya is including in her story. Is she actually telling them? And then Gabby came outside and showed her friend a new pair of ice skates. I hope so. I hope so. But listen, listen, she's she's like what? One like Nobel Prize for literature. Or oh, whatever. yeah. So, you know, oh, what? Yeah. She, she knows what she's doing. Absolutely. <laughs> Elmo was talking to Mr. Hanford and forgetful Jones walked past them and said nothing. <laughs> He forgot his lines. But, there, there he is. <laughs> but Elmo, of course, wants to tell people he met Santa, starting with Gordon, who just replies, oh, of course you did. Gives Elmo his Christmas present and then leaves because he's got places to be. It's Christmas. Kind of bothers me that we never really see. We never see what's in the present. What did Gordon get, Elmo? I, yeah, I really no. I do want to know. We don't know what, what Gordon gets him. Then Elmo he, meets. We got him a diet soda. Got him a diet <laughs> soda in a rectangular box used for clothing yeah <laughs> <laughs> then elmo meets someone i honestly didn't even remember but it's a teenager named carlo hi elmo oh hi carlo guess what what elmo saw santa claus oh that's yeah. nice elmo. and he gave elmo this really yeah oh sure yeah short-lived from this period yeah okay he was there yeah he was around for a few years he's uh, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Whip It, starring Elliot Page. And I have not. Elias Shawkat. Uh, Carlo is in it. Hey. Yeah. And that's the only other thing I've ever seen him in, but I was so excited. Wow. <laughs> I feel like Carlo very quickly got overshadowed by, like, Savion, who I was surprised wasn't in this. Savion's gone, I think. I think he's yeah. five is, his, is, his, is the end of the line for Savion. Yeah. Oh, OK. I apologize then. Yeah. 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 I remember Savion being before that. That's another movie. Like when I when I later watched Bring the Noise, Bring on the Funk, I'm like, wait yeah. a minute. Yeah. Oh, no. He's <laughs> like Savion from Sesame Street. Well, yep. but even on Sesame Street, he was always tap like he was like do tap classes or yeah. whatever. Right. Like, oh, yeah. That was his thing. That was his thing. Yeah. Love it. Also, I mean, I, well, Savion's not even in this. He is in the the New Year's Eve special. Yes, uh, from a few years earlier. He's has a oh, big really? role in that. Okay, which is, yeah, which is sometimes called Sesame Street stays up late, and sometimes Sesame Street celebrates around the world. Huh. If you ever do, uh, if you ever do a New Year's Eve spinoff of your podcast, might be harder, but you know, if you ever do, <laughs> noted. Yeah, no, I haven't done a lot of New Year's stuff. Good idea. So we see Carlo and Carlo also talks about Christmas and how great it is. Yeah, it does the same thing. Elmo tells him he saw Santa, shows him his magic wishing snow globe. Carlo listens, but he too says, oh, that's nice. Gives him a present and a hug and leaves, as does Rosita. And I'm starting to see now why Elmo didn't tell anyone this story himself. <laughs> he tried. He tried, but he also doesn't seem bothered by this. This all just reaffirms how much he loves Christmas. And here's where the thought occurs to him. Elmo wish it was Christmas every day. <gasps> That's Elmo's second wish. That's right, kids. It's another Christmas every day plot. Just like the Eric Von Detten movie, Christmas every day. That's right. You know, not to jump ahead, 
but it kind of is relevant to that. This is another Christmas every day, but I feel like this deals with certain elements of what would happen if Christmas was every day that I don't really see in other stuff. Well, just because it's it's weird because it doesn't mean that December 25th is repeated. Right. It means that people are compelled to treat every day of the year as though it is the holiday Christmas. Right. Which is a, a different premise. You know, it's we're not repeating the same day, like in Groundhog Day or whatever. Right. Or like in Christmas Every Day starring Rick Martin. It's laughably bizarre that, like, these characters will grow to hate the idea of Christmas, but no one thinks, like, hey, you know, maybe we could just, you know, just go back, stop, just, go to work, just stop. <laughs> You know, <laughs> right. we'll, only, well, and, we'll only count one of these Christmases as the real Christmas. Like, right. Yeah. Well, and, and and that's what I that's what I meant earlier when I said that this movie is about like how you have to observe Christmas traditions, whether you want to or not. This special because because yeah. it, it really is like it's they're like it's July 4th and we're still celebrating Christmas. Oh, my voice is hoarse or whatever. Yeah. And and. There's no reason for them to be doing that. It, no. it really doesn't make any sense. No. But that's what's fun about it. Yeah. Well, and the last time I covered a Christmas everyday plot was very similar to this. It was an episode of The Adventures of Pete and Pete. Have you ever seen that one? Oh, yeah. Classic. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Christmas Pete, right? That's the one. Yeah. Season three, so not not one of my favorites. I kind of I right. feel like the show was running out of steam by then a sure. little bit. Sure. Oh, it was. But but this is probably my favorite one out of that last season. Yeah, it's the one where their garbage man refuses to pick up their trash if they don't stop celebrating Christmas. Right. Yeah. yeah. Classic. Man, I should rewatch every single one of those apps. Oh, <laughs> a great show. Loved it. So Elmo makes it official, shakes his snow globe, shouts Blitzen. And I like the swirly wipe effect they use to show a wish has been granted. Very 1990s video editing here. Mm hmm. But from Elmo's perspective, nothing's different. Of course, nothing's different. It's still Christmas Day proper. He's three and a half. You got to be sure. patient with him. Oh, yeah. The first people to realize something's different are Santa's elves who are dressed for vacation. They're all in Hawaiian shirts and sunglasses and straw hats. One elf is wearing Mickey Mouse ears. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> But their daydreams are dashed as an alarm sounds. It's the christmas ometer which turns their toy <laughs> machine back on and it starts cranking out toys again. The, you know, again, this this movie weirdly is like movie. We keep saying movie. I know Ryan is going to be it's so, so mad cinematic. at us. Cinematic. <laughs> Ryan is going to be mad at us. Ryan hates when you call specials movie. I know. Ryan is my co-host on on Moving Right. Yeah, on. yeah. I don't care so much about it, but I understand. Very listen. <laughs> so, in this special, again, weird how many different aspects of labor issues they want to cover. <laughs> like <laughs> when Christmas is every day, the elves become overworked, but also like the economy shuts down. It's like. I don't know. I, I, you could, you could do a decent, you know, a decent term paper on this using you like could. the Marxist lens. <laughs> you could. Well, and even, even um, Santa tells Elmo, he says something to him like, "If nobody goes to work, nobody will make all the things we need." Right. Yeah. Like he, Santa says that to Elmo in this special. Yeah, I like that he points that out later. But for right now, uh, Santa's. In his office, practicing his putting game, which surprises me only because I always pictured him spending Christmas Day taking a long nap. He experiences time differently than we do, so who knows how much sleep yeah. he actually gets. Yeah, maybe he only slept for six minutes and then he starts playing golf. There it is. But Santa's as shocked as the elves to learn it's apparently Christmas again. And the elf wearing the Mickey ears asks, did you give someone three wishes again? How many times has this happened? <laughs> well then i guess this also might suggest that he's lying about never getting stuck in the chimney before oh yeah that was just a thing he told elmo to make himself seem more impressive yeah to emphasize how much of a hero he was for saving christmas i never get stuck you really saved my butt kid mm -hmm. 
However many times it's been, it's apparently not enough for Santa to realize, hey, maybe don't give anyone these magic snow globes anymore. But Santa realizes what's happened, gets ready to leave immediately to go talk to Elmo, tells his elves to get his sleigh ready and hitch up a reindeer. But all the reindeer are resting after a long flight. If only there were some other reindeer available to pull Santa's sleigh. Hey, look, it's lightning. Olive. No. Okay. Olive. <laughs> oh, man. I wish Olive was in this. Drew Barrymore, the director of Whip It, featuring Carlo. Hey, it all ties together. It's it's all in the Tommy <laughs> West fault snow globe. Hey, cousin Tommy. <laughs> the magic, the magic Tommy West snow globe. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Yeah, St. Elsewhere was only one of his three wishes. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> Yeah, that kid spells his name wrong. No, right. There you go. <laughs> Santa objects at first because Lightning's just a kid. But since that appears to be the only feasible option at the moment, he's the deer for the job. And back on Sesame Street, a bunch of folks are at Hooper's store watching It's a Wonderful Life some more, which is interrupted by a breaking news flash. We take you now to Kermit the Frog for a fast-breaking news story. It's the same classic theme music, but a different title card with a map of the world behind it instead of the classic Thundercloud, which I'm wearing on my shirt tonight. But yeah, I'm always happy to see Kermit in his news outfit, though. Well, this is one of Kermit's very few appearances on Sesame Street uh, as played by Steve Whitmire. Yes. You know, like he didn't he didn't come back to Sesame Street too much by this time. So it's really special to have him here, I think. And Steve, Steve Whitmire in general wasn't really on Sesame Street much as any characters. Like Steve, Wait, there, Ernie, there was a couple yeah, of seasons Ernie. where Ernie was around a lot. Yes, well, because they did um, Journey to Ernie. You're right, and yep. then they also did um, Ernie's Show and Tell was another recurring segment. Oh, yeah. But there was a period where Ernie was not around much, and and this this special definitely exists in that era because. As Anthony alluded to earlier, Ernie and Bert do not have a single line of dialogue in this entire special. No. They are there. They're in the background. And there's a good Ernie and Bert joke that we'll, I'm sure we'll get to. Mm -hmm. But um, they don't say anything in this special. And again, it's so weird. This is Steve Whitmire's only voice line in this special is is or voice lines in this special is during this news news break yes and it appears to be the first appearance of reporter kermit on sesame street as steve whitmire since the death of jim henson in 1990 and i looked it up on muppet wiki there were only two other appearances in 1992 on other programs there was a pbs documentary called on television teach the children and once for Good Morning America, where Kermit reported live from good old Coosbane. But also, it wouldn't even happen much more beyond this. No. Uh, it, he's in Elmo Palooza. He's in, he's in Cinder Elmo. Book, That's right. right. Elmo Palooza and Cinder Elmo, and also in the um, the Hurricane episodes. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2001-ish, is that about right? Yes, it, it was 2002. It was in response to September 11th the uh her okay. episodes yep oh, oh right of course it was yeah 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 they yeah. they tried to think of a disaster that they could teach kids about that didn't involve you know man's cruelty to man right <laughs> right yeah. but use it as a metaphor um for like yeah right well and he's in the 50th uh or he's matt vogel isn't he in the 50th he's matt by then i think yeah, so be... yeah yes, uh 2019 yes. yeah that's Matt. yeah he's also not a reporter yeah uh but right right he sings being green with elvis Costello. yeah mm-hmm Kermit is really funny here, though. He is. Yeah, it's a good bit. It's a good Kermit bit. Yeah. Reports the news that despite it being Christmas today, it's apparently also going to be Christmas again tomorrow. And hearing that news, a passerby offers Kermit $50 for his microphone, and Kermit refuses at first. <laughs> my kid wants a microphone. I'll give you 50 bucks for yours. Uh, certainly not. This news frog's mic is not for sale. How about 100 You want that wrapped? Nope. Again, and that's that's definitely like we talk a lot as Muppet fans about like Muppet show Kermit versus like other Kermits and that on the Muppet show and also on early Sesame Street, Kermit was kind of like, again, weirdly cynical and like 
definitely had a kind of selfish streak in addition to obviously like he did care about his friends and you know all of these programs sure steve whitmire rarely got to play a kermit like this who was like oh yeah sure you want that gift wrap yeah. like all right yeah, yeah. that's not like the kermit of muppet christmas carol again no and if you want to hear more on that listen to anthony's podcast moving right along where they spent like 18 episodes i feel like talking about the differences <laughs> yeah i guess so yes moving right along just finished a whole season covering the muppet christmas carol two minutes at a time it's wonderful can't recommend it enough thank you thank you so much we we certainly had fun doing it yes tell you that. it was fun to listen to thanks well, that is all the confirmation Elmo needs that his wish has indeed been granted, and we get a reprise of the song from the beginning, It's Christmas Again! Hang the tinsel on the tree, it's Christmas again! Again! And at first, everyone on Sesame Street seems a bit confused, but they don't seem bothered by the news. <laughs> Except for Santa, he's in disguise as a bell ringing Santa just happens to also be the actual Santa because of course it's the same Santa. Who else would it be? It's Sesame Street. Right. Of course. He stops Elmo and explains the gravity of the situation. If it's Christmas every day, that means people will work, have every day off for the holiday. And if they don't work, who will make things others need? And if kids don't go to school, how will they learn the alphabet? Well, Santa, I learned the alphabet before I even went to school. You know how? From Sesame Street. (laughs) I was going to say. But to drive home his point, Santa sings Elmo a song called Every Day Can't Be Christmas. Every day can't be Christmas. That wouldn't be such a treat. You can get tired of chocolate candy when that's all you eat. Yeah, it rules. I love this song so much. I do. Charles Durning is trying his best, but let me tell you, there's a reason Charles Durning didn't get a song in uh, the Muppet movie. <laughs> that, is, that is objectively false. Charles Durning sings the song, Frog Legs, Frog Legs, Frog Legs are fine. Hoppers is a place you should die. He absolutely sings a song in the Muppet movie. He does sing Right, yeah. right. He, he's the breakout musical find, 1979. <laughs> But no, of course he's of course he's not a great singer. But I do I enjoy this song and I get it in my head a lot. Yeah, so. there is that one part of the bridge where he's like, "Wait for joy," where it's really nice for that one second. Sure, and the, you're right. The rest of it is every day can't be a birthday. Yeah, <laughs> that wouldn't be such a treat. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> you're, oh, you're yeah. right, Becca. <laughs> it's very reading off the cue cards, but yeah, I mean, like. Yeah. This is a special where, you know, like, we also have Bob and 14 Carat Soul singing. Their voices right. are better. Sure, yeah, we yes. can all have Bob singing voice. <laughs> we were spoiled. This might be a controversial take. I would much rather listen to Charles Durning sing than Harvey Firestein. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. You are alone in that one. But we will get there. I like Harvey Firestein as a as a writer and as a performer. I do. I think he's funny. I think he's great. Not into him as a singer, as we'll discuss <laughs> later. We will discuss later. For now, the general message of this song is: if every day is special, no day is. Right, just like Sindro. <laughs> I was about to say uh, the Incredibles. Yep. yep. I think that's exactly why I wrote it the way I wrote it in my notes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, I was going to say you said it just like Sindro. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So there is a soundtrack of sorts for this special called Elmo Saves Christmas Holiday Favorites. This song isn't even on it. No. In fact, none of the songs are on it except for It's Christmas Again, and it's sung by different characters. Yeah, it's a Muppet version. It's an all Muppet album. And I actually like that album quite a lot. I reviewed it for Tough Pigs some years ago. Like, I I say I reviewed it for Tough Pigs. It was already 15 years old or something at that time. (laughs) Uh, okay, but uh, it's a it's a what it is is a fun collection of mid '90s Muppets singing Christmas songs. What it is not is a soundtrack to this special. Nope. Um, it does have Elmo singing a song called "Elmo Saves Christmas" that's not in the special, and is very bad. That's why Elmo saves Christmas for Christmas. 
It, it is very bad. Just a weird pairing of two things that are supposed to be related, but aren't. Yeah. Just like how on the Elmo Says Boo album, Elmo sings a song called Elmo Says Boo that is not in the special and is not very good. <laughs> Wait, is that true? I didn't I didn't even know there was an Elmo Says Boo album. Anthony, Anthony, didn't. I'm going to have to send this to you. There's oh, a please. song, <laughs> Elmo Sings a Duet with the Count, and it has these terrible lyrics where Elmo, like, at one point, like, says, it's time to spook a lies. <laughs> Is one of the lyrics. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Uh, uh, for the listeners, uh, Elmo Says Boo is a Halloween video yep. from about 1997 where Elmo goes over to the Count's castle and they tell each other a series of, quote, scary, funny jokes. And it is one of the greatest things ever made. <laughs> By which I mean, it's pretty bad. It's pretty but bad. I love it. But it's an entertaining bad. Yes. Yes, 100%. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> Much like the song Elmo Says Boo, it's time to spook a lie. <laughs> Elmo saves Christmas, we'll return. You're in for a spooky treat when Elmo says boo. Join Elmo as he visits the Count at his eerie castle. Together they share some of the scariest and funniest stories, jokes, and songs. It's an uproarious good time. And on board Book and Tape, there's more hilarious haunted fun with everyone's favorite little red monster in Who's Afraid of Elmo? Spooky around here, isn't it? It's the first day of school, and I'm walking around downtown Chicago with hundreds of other students. Everyone's getting back from summer break, and you can tell that they're happy to see each other after a couple months. For me, however, it's been a little longer. Hi. I'm David, and I want to introduce you to Returning Student, a documentary podcast that I've been making about my return to a college that I left 20 years ago. I'm back in the same city, at the same school, the same student ID number. Everything else feels completely different. My fellow classmates are literally half my age. My professors work in my industry. Sometimes I wonder why I've come back at all. But then I get the opportunity to sit down with one of my professors and have a conversation with them, which uh, usually yields a little bit of wisdom. You can find the show on all major podcast providers, as well as our website, returningstudentpodcast.com. A lot has changed over the past two decades. Well, Elmo doesn't really want to listen to what Santa has to say here. He gave Elmo three wishes, and that was one of his wishes. But Santa decides he wants Elmo to see the consequences of his actions, and it's going to take some more time to show him. So he gives Elmo another gift, a sleigh just for Elmo, pulled by lightning, whom we learn can fly faster than time, which hurts to think about, but just don't think about it. They do literally stage this just like in Superman the movie. They yeah. do. 100%. Even the music as they're flying over the globe has that same sort of... Dun, dun, dun. And so, lightning carried Elmo out of snowy winter. Santa tells Lightning to fly past the morning sunrise into the days after tomorrow, which he gives directions like he's Peter Pan. <laughs> I love a good time travel story, so off Elmo goes into the future to see what Christmas will be like when it stretches into spring and summer and a year from then, so he can see if, it's, if he still wants it to be Christmas every day after that. And Maya Angelou tells us a puff of warm wind suddenly told Elmo it was springtime. And she could have written that for all I know. That's just a very <laughs> Maya Angelou line, whether she wrote it or it was written specifically for her. Well done. Lightning crashes mm -hmm. into the park. Don't worry, they're fine. But again, the park was another part of the Around the Corner set. Yes. The angel opens her eyes. Yeah. So, wait, wait. Oh, we're, we're not doing this. You nope. said lightning crash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Go placenta on. just fell through the floor at that joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, lightning crash lands into the park. <laughs> Don't worry, they're fine. Camera shakes for a second just to give the effect of a crash. And sure enough, the park is abloom with beautiful spring flowers. And the count informs us it's the 124th day of Christmas he's counted, which means 
The date is April 26th. It's such a good role for the count to count oh, how yeah. many Christmases it's been. It's like a nice, such a good use. But also it's weird because they keep saying that it's May. They do in the song, like they reprise that it's Christmas again song and they're they're saying it's May. The snow has melted clean away. There's only grass for Santa say. And though it's very warm for May, it's Christmas again. But I counted it. It's, it's April 26th. OK, weird. With an asterisk we'll talk about a little later, but it's still Christmas and we see Gabby again. This time she's got a new pair of rollerblades instead of ice skates. Yeah, that's great. And and this is where we have 14 karat soul. This is where they like really get the solo. Yes. Christmas time again. Yeah. But most importantly. Before we get there, Elmo decides to go visit the fix it shop. Right. Only to find it's closed for Christmas. So now there's a small pile of toasters outside the shop and Maria and Luis walk by with another pile of wrapped presents in each of their arms. I guess some places are open if they're still buying stacks of gifts every day. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. And speaking of places open on Christmas, Grover is still selling Christmas trees. Or should I say Christmas tree? Because he only has one left and all the needles have fallen off. A fact pointed out by Grover's eternal customer who's doomed to conduct matters of business with him till the end of time, Mr. Johnson. Ho, ho, ho. Is that the best tree you've got? Well, it is not only the best, sir, but the only tree I have. I think that stuff is great. That is his name, right? You are right. <laughs> That's okay. his name. Yeah. It's just the name. It's not, it's kind of not anything, but yeah. No, yeah, he said it in one sketch, and so that's what we all decided on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's canonical. Um, I think that the stuff with Grover and, and Mr. Johnson, or the customer, as I usually call him, mm-hmm. uh, I think that stuff is, is so good in this special. It's it's Frank Oz and Jerry Nelson just goofing around, you know. Yep. It's, I love it. Yeah, it's it's separate. It's separate from everything else, but it's important to realize, and Grover will build on this later, but like like I said about this special kind of dealing with things that I feel like a lot of these kind of specials don't Grover is like, yeah, Christmas trees are endangered. now. Yes. I have yeah, that right. note. And he just says it in passing, but I honed in on that. Wait a minute. The forests have been cleaned out. Yeah. Grover's Grover's going all one slur. Like he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's building an ax machine like the one slur to chop down all the Christmas trees. <laughs> yeah. The special ends with baby Natasha holding the last Christmas tree. Scene. <laughs> but yeah, like again, and I think that's because of this weird choice that they, they did where it isn't like a groundhog stay loop or like every day is Christmas, but very much like it is April. It has been 127 days. Yes. And everybody seems to every day get a new Christmas tree and get new gifts. Because again, like Anthony said, they're just (laughs) slaves to these traditions. Yeah. Right. Right. Like Mr. Johnson needs a new tree every time it's Christmas. He keeps coming back to Grover and he doesn't care how big it is. He'll take it, whatever the last tree that still has needles on it at an agreed price of three whole dollars. So Grover goes to drag a humongous Christmas tree across the camera for us. Well, humongous to Grover, it looks like a normal human sized Christmas tree to me. Yeah, (laughs) right. Grover, Grover's pretty small. Grover's very tiny. He has those spindly arms. Very tiny, but very strong. Be able to pull that tree. Oh, he's a superhero. That's true. He is. Wait, where did you hear that? Shh. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase. He looks like he looks like he could be related to a superhero. There we go. <laughs> if only he had glasses. Well, now we cut the big bird who's got a whole pile of letters to Snuffy saying he misses him stacked up on his nest there because Snuffy said he'd be coming back on the day after Christmas, but it hasn't been the day after Christmas yet. So Snuffy is essentially stuck at his grandmother's in Cincinnati. (laughs) Because they're not coming back until the day after Christmas. Right. What? 
But what really upsets Big Bird is the fact that the mail doesn't get picked up on Christmas either, so he can't send these letters to Snuffy. It's true. Big Bird, by the way, is wearing a lovely Christmas tree necktie. I usually only see Big Bird in a tie when he's in a theme park, but this looks really nice on him. Yeah, it's. I agree. It's a good look. Mm-hmm. But and and this is where he says the line I alluded to at the start of the podcast, right? That he'll yes. he'll have to read the letters when he gets back. If he gets back, if he can learn to read, right? Which we talked about the special being very funny, but I don't think we talked about who actually wrote it, right? Which is Tony Geis and Christine Ferraro. Okay, who were longtime Sesame Street writers, both of them. Uh, Christine Ferraro, I think that's mostly what she did in her career, as far as I know. Because Tony, Tony Geis co-wrote like an American Tale and Land Before Time oh, and, and some other stuff. Oh yeah, well. I know that name now that you mention it and you say that. Yeah, but he wrote at Sesame Street for like twenty years and wrote many, many co-wrote a lot of songs for Sesame Street, usually with Judy Freudberg, who he also wrote those Don Bluth movies with. Okay, but it's him and Christine Ferraro are the two credited writers here, and it's a very funny script. So I think I, I just wanted to give him a shout out. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But Elmo and Lightning happen to look on as Big Bird is the first character to wish it would stop being Christmas soon. But Elmo's sure Big Bird will start having fun when he starts playing with all his new toys. So he's sure Big Bird will be just fine. What's much more important is whom we meet next. It's the Christmas Bunny. Actually, the Easter Bunny in a Santa hat. Played by Harvey Firestein. Christmas eggs, get your Christmas eggs right here. Christmas Hi, eggs. hello. Uh, who are you? Well, I'm the Christmas bunny. Well, no, you're not. You're the Easter bunny. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then how come I got all these here Christmas eggs? This is the weirdest choice in the entire special. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> it's so weird, but I love it. <laughs> This whole scene, because Harvey Firestein is going to sing a song about all the things you can do with eggs. Yes, he has to repurpose his business now that Christmas has bled into his holiday. Buy your friends an Easter egg for Christmas. Easter eggs are useful as can be. Take your Christmas money to your local bunny and you can lay an egg beneath the Christmas tree. This whole scene feels like... There's part of me that's like, oh, they, they just should have cut this whole thing. This whole thing is pointless. But then part of me is like, I don't know. He, he, the eggs do this little dance. There are chickens who need to tell us that the eggs came from them. That's good. I like the chickens. The chicken did it. Yeah. Anyway, Anthony doesn't like Harvey Firestein. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> Anthony hates Harvey Firestein. <laughs> no. You think you of my older brother, who used to get so mad every time we watched Independence Day about Harvey Firestein's presence in the movie. Um, no, that's not true. I like him. I wish he'd been in the Hairspray movie, you know, yeah. instead of John Travolta. Um, but I just don't understand why he, like, I, I mean, and I know he sings on stage and all that. I know he sings in hairspray, of course, as we said, but there's just something about this Easter bunny song and this special that I find grating. It doesn't belong. It doesn't belong. I guess that's the thing. Yeah. It's so totally different. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, it, it's so totally different. It doesn't feel like a Christmas special song and it isn't. But like, it isn't. No, it it it's so out of place, so out of left field. But I love it for that reason. It's just it's so bizarre. I'm just like, it draws me in. Sure. He's rhyming all of these things you can do with your eggs. You can name it Fred. Hi, Fred. It's just <laughs> sure. Well, and the most, you know, the most important thing of all is this is the the first but not the last time. Harvey Firestein will sing about smelling a rose on Sesame Street because a couple of years later, uh, he will sing Everything's Coming Up Noses on <laughs> Sesame Street, a parody of Everything's Coming Up Roses about noses. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that is one of my favorite <laughs> of Sesame Street sketches. Beautiful. Yeah. He's a perfect fit in the fact that he's completely not the perfect fit. And it's just 
I'm glad it's here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's grating, but I'm glad it's here. <laughs> but everything's going great. Christmas in April is is yeah. perfect. Sure, as far as Elmo can tell, Christmas in springtime doesn't seem bad at all. So it's time for them to once again fly into the future to summer. In the Northern Hemisphere, anyway. I'm sure the Southern (laughs) Hemisphere would love to have Christmas in July when it's winter for them. But they continue flying forward in time. Back at Santa's workshop, meanwhile, the elves are getting so overworked and backed up, they've started to mix up some of the toys, resulting in a very cute stuffed cow with rabbit ears that the elves decide to call a Moo Bunny. Moo Bunny. And I want one. Yeah, the the Moo Bunny is actually better than, than a cow. It is better than a cow. Yeah. Well, and I think it's better that like that they at the beginning they just have like a teddy bear. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the moo bunny is better than that. I mean so much better. My daughter has a lot of pink stuffies and she loves them. So she'd yep. disagree with me. But <laughs> I like that moo bunny. The moo bunny reminded me. Do y'all remember the wuzzles? Of course. Sure, yeah, yeah. This is a wuzzle. Moo Bunny reminds you of one? Yeah, because they were combined animals. Yeah, they, they definitely had a combined animals vibe. Yeah. Also reminds me of Avatar The Last Airbender. True. Where oh. most of the animals are like, uh, you know, a bear dog or whatever. Okay. And Except one. Who are you talking about, Momo? No. The the whole joke in the... in The, the penguin, Earth... penguin sledding? No, the whole joke in the Earth Kingdom where there's... They just have a bear. Oh, nobody knows what the bear is. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's just a bear. And they're like, do you mean, do you mean a, a, a dragon bear? Do you mean <laughs> a beaver bear? And they're like, no, it's a bear. No, it's a bear. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I know. I just always think of in the first episode where the first thing Aang ever says is, do you want to go penguin sledding with me? <laughs> and it's just a penguin as far as we can know. You know. Avatar rules. We should watch that. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. Anyways, <laughs> there we on. go. All right. No. Well, back on Sesame Street, it's now the 4th of July, which the count tells us is Christmas number 193, which would be correct, but only if it's a leap year. Oh, weird. And 1996 was a leap year. So, right. Maybe this just happened this past year, and then when Elmo reversed time again, that's the story Maya Angelou is telling us. Oh, but this, but that would have been Christmas 95 then if it's, if it's 1996 leap year. Yeah. Christmas 95, but then leap day happens right, after that Christmas. But right, that makes but that's sense. What I'm saying. This came out in Christmas 96. So it's yeah. the story of the previous year. Yeah. Because yeah. Maya right, Angelou yeah. is telling a past story, you know? So yeah. Right. Didn't Elmo ever tell you? Right. But that year never happened. It got reset. So. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So we see people decorating the now bear tree in the courtyard with U.S. flags and streamers. And we can start to see the tired looks on people's faces, including Maria and Louise, who are still closed for Christmas. They can't fix those toasters. No, they wistfully remember before it was always Christmas and people would bring them things to fix and they fixed it. And Maria snaps a little bit here. Maria, Christmas, Christmas is fun. I'm sick of having fun, Elmo. Toasters. That's what Maria was so good at, though. Like, oh, yes. Oh, man. Maria, again, and follow that bird is such a great example of this. Mm-hmm. Of, like Her pairings with Oscar all the time. Yes. Like Maria really was, you know, was obviously so kind and loving to all of the Muppets, but also like. Did have an attitude. Yeah, no. Th- and that makes her the perfect mother figure because mm-hmm. of that. Right. Uh, That's when a switch yeah. flips. You have to deal with that. And she deals with it the way that it needs to be dealt with. Right. Well, and I remember reading an interview with Sonia Manzano once where she talked about how they were always fixing toasters on at the fix-it shop. And she said that that doesn't make any sense. Nobody gets a toaster fixed. You just buy a new toaster. (laughs) And until I read that interview, it had never occurred to me. Me like neither. There's, same, there's same. no reason for them to be fixing all these toasters, but it makes it even funnier. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, and here's the first time Elmo realizes, oh, maybe this isn't as fun as he thought it might be. 
also struggling with businesses, Grover, still selling Christmas trees despite not having any more actual Christmas trees, but he offers to sell Mr. Johnson a delightfully decorated coat rack. Yeah. With a coat still on it. Looks like a wooden Festivus pole. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, I I always kind of wondered if this was a callback to the Peter Ustinov episode of The Muppet Show. Good, good call. Good call. <laughs> Where yeah, the coat rack, or is it a hat rack? It is a hat okay. rack, and the Peter hat Eastern rack. Episode, yeah, yeah, it is one of the writers. It's one of the credited writers. <laughs> yes, in the Peter Eastern <laughs> episode of the Moment Show. <laughs> this is his brother. Yeah, just yeah, exactly. But I love Grover's pitch. If you squint and turn your head, kind of cock your head like that, it almost looks like a hemlock. Yeah, that's hey, right. You know, Frank Oz is good at his job. He is. I so good. Next, we see how Big Bird's holding up, and he's in his nest watching It's a Wonderful Life, because that's apparently all there is on TV anymore. Right. But since Big Bird can't mail Snuffy a letter, he decides to try calling his friend in Cincinnati. So he does, but it goes to his granny's answering machine. So Big Bird puts the phone on speaker and begins to sing a completely original song that happens to also be called All I Want for Christmas is You. I don't want anything that you pull on a string. All I want for Christmas is you. Some jacks and a ball wouldn't please me at all. All I want for Christmas is you. Yeah, again, when we were watching this, my fiancé was like... Oh, this is this is gonna replace replace that one, huh? Like, <laughs> sure is. Mariah Carey, who? <laughs> <laughs> and that song was only two years old. Yeah, the special came out, so it so it did exist. It wow, you're like right. The, the Mariah Carey song already existed. It yes, is it not, did. Not as good as the Mariah Carey song, but it's fun. Well, what is? Yeah, no, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, the best part is when Big Bird during the bridge does a little dance and narrates his little <laughs> dance for Snuffy is like, I'm doing a little dance. I'm dancing in a circle now. You can't see me, Snuffy. I'm doing a little soft shoe. Cause I'm happy. I'm talking to you. Yeah, that's great. That's the best part for sure. Can we talk about uh, a Sesame street Christmas Carol at this time? We can. Yes. Because so that's a, have you covered that thing on this podcast, Mike? Not yet. No. That's probably fine, and you never should, because <laughs> it's awful. But uh, this is a spe- direct-to-video special where Oscar the Grouch is Ebenezer Scrooge. And one of the things that I find fascinating about that special is when the Ghost of Christmas Past character comes to talk to him, the two past clips that we see are Ernie and Bert exchanging presents in Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. A good mm. special. A great, Yeah, a great special. And this scene from this special. Huh. Because apparently if Big Bird is in it and is the star, it's from the Christmas past. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> huh. Because uh, later on they show every day can't be Christmas and that's part of that's Christmas present, you know, because it stars Elmo. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. It's weird. Well, it's kind of like in the 35th special mm. where Grover takes Elmo in a magical taxi to see Sesame Street history and brings Elmo to Maria and Luis's wedding that Elmo was the ring bearer. He was the at. ring bearer. Don't drop the ring, Elmo. Right, yeah, he like sings part of the big the big operetta on the roof. Yes, yeah, he yeah. sure does. <laughs> that is burned into my brain. Right, although that moment in the 35th does have a great joke where Grover takes him to see the adoption of Miles. Yes. Gordon and Susan's adoption of Miles. And he says, and they are a family still. And Gordon is bald still. <laughs> <laughs> Which I really like. <laughs> Anyways. Yes. After this song is over, Big Bird shouts, I wish it would stop being Christmas so I could see Snuffy again. And Lightning tells Elmo, maybe wishing for Christmas every day wasn't such a good idea. And at that suggestion, Oscar emerges from his trash can to tell Bambi Face to speak for himself. An ugly pile of toasters by the fix-it shop, trash full of wrapping paper and worn-out Christmas trees, and nothing on television but it's a wonderful life. Yeah, it's a bah humbug Christmas every day. (laughs) As much as Oscar has sung about hating Christmas in the past (laughs) on two other specials we've covered, this is different. 
He very much loves to see toasters and trash piling up and needles falling off trees. But Elmo insists everyone will be happy again when it's the real Christmas again in December and there's snow on the ground. So Elmo asks Lightning to take him to the actual Christmas on December the 25th. I was a little upset that they skipped Christmas and fall. Yeah, me too. Because I'll tell you, I've always been wondering, what would it be like if there was like a cross between Halloween and Christmas? (laughs) Like, let's say, what if like, like the spooky Halloween characters, like a skeleton and a boogeyman, (laughs) what if they tried to do Christmas themselves? What would that be like? And I was hoping (laughs) this special could do it. But I guess I'll never know what that would be like. What a well, great well, well, idea. Becca, uh, Becca, Be- Becca mm-hmm. I can actually answer that for you. Yeah. Oh. It would involve Elmo going over to the Count's castle to tell him, <laughs> to <laughs> him, to tell him no, some merry, funny jokes. Hey, I'm going to plug it because Anthony didn't. One of my favorite Tough Pigs articles of all time is Anthony did a ranking of all of the funny, scary jokes from Elmo says, <laughs> oh. ranked them in terms of how scary they were and how funny they were. Yes. I'm glad you did both. I gave them a rating on a scale of one to 10 in each category. It's a descent into madness. <laughs> I think about it all the time. Oh, is that right? Oh, oh I, okay. absolutely, I absolutely do. I mean, listen, I, I use, I use, and I use some of those screenshots from it as reaction images. Uh, our, <laughs> our favorite, our favorite Joey and Davey monkey reaction images from that article. Oh, where, oh where wow. That, where that kid is like not into Joey yeah, and Not Davey into monkey. Joey and Davey. <laughs> At all. Yeah. 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 So that's in the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Becca. I didn't. You're I did, welcome. I truly. Didn't know that article had fans. Oh, so 100%. Didn't. But anyway, they skip fall. Jokes aside. <laughs> they skip fall. Yeah. And sure enough, there's snow on the ground, but the rest of Sesame Street is in rough shape. Think the alternate timeline in Back to the Future Part 2 with just a tiny bit less violence. Mm-hmm. A bunch of storefronts are not only closed, but boarded up. Trash bags full of wrapping paper are piled up along the curbs. But you know, it's really bad when we meet the Count and he's tired of counting Christmases. Ah, yes. December 25th, once the official Christmas Day. This year, just Christmas number 365. And wrong! He's so tired of it, he doesn't care or realize that he miscounts. He says it's Christmas number 365. But counting the first day of Christmas and the leap day we determined was in there, this would be day 367 count. (laughs) Yeah, count, get it together. But he's he's burnt out. (laughs) He's burnt out. And he's not the only one who's tired of Christmas. The count brings Elmo and Lightning to see our carolers, Bob and Gina and 14 Carat Soul, all with (laughs) hoarse voices now because they've sung every day. Hang the star upon the tree. It's Christmas again. Sing every day. Well, to be fair, doesn't Bob sing every day anyway? <laughs> hey, yeah. Right. Uh, presumably, 14 Karen Soul does as well. Yes. An acapella group. That's your job. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, I get it. Grover still has Christmas trees for sale, only 25 cents, by which he means his sign that reads Christmas trees for sale is on sale for 25 cents. I like that. I I enjoy that joke. I think it's funny. That's a great joke. This escalation of the Grover Johnson thing gets so good. This this particular scene. That's all he has left because Christmas trees are apparently now extinct. Thanks, Elmo. (laughs) Yeah. Cool, Elmo. (laughs) This this special really should be called Elmo Destroys Christmas. Elmo Destroys Christmas. That's mostly what it's about. It is. But he only destroys Christmas once. He saves it twice. He does. That's true. Yeah, that is true. That is true. One of which is his own fault. Correct. But he saves it from himself. But still. But following that lovely Grover and Johnson bit, we cut to an even better joke. We're at the fix-it shop and Bert and Ernie are walking past. Again, saying nothing. These two have been in the background for this whole special, and here they are walking by the pile of toasters and other appliances, which now includes TV sets, playing what else? It's a Wonderful Life. 
And it's the scene where George is in Pottersville in the world where he was never born. And he's shouting at Bert the cop and Ernie the cab driver. Bert, oh, come on, Ernie, come on. what's the matter with you two guys? You, you, you were here on my wedding night. You both of you stood out there on the porch and sung to us. Don't you remember? So our Bert and Ernie hear their names, stop, stare at the TV, and turn slowly to the camera with shocked looks on their faces. This was a brilliant ending to the whole It's a Wonderful Life bit. I mean, one, I agree. Yes, it's especially because for 27 years at this point, I have to imagine Mm -hmm. people would watch It's a Wonderful Life and say, wow, Bert and Ernie, wow. Like that, that can't be a coincidence. It sounds like it apparently is a coincidence. Like Jim Henson, John, John Stone, everyone involved has always said it, it actually is a coincidence. And I can't imagine why they would lie about that. Cause it's not like they would be sued or any, you know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. You can name characters after characters in movies and, you know, right. Lord knows they did that on Sesame Street all the time. Like, oh, yeah. Like Columbo, you yeah. know? Like Columbo. <laughs> yeah. Polly Darton. Love Polly Darton. Uh, Meryl Sheep. Anyways, um, but it's it's but it's but definitely a thing people notice. You know, you watch It's a Wonderful Life and you're like, whoa, Ernie and Bert. Yes. So the fact that like they do this whole It's a Wonderful Life runner leading up to Ernie and Bert being startled by it themselves, it's great. It's perfect. It really is. Well, and it's also weird. Not weird, but like weird in a good way, I guess. You know, like I said, Bert and Ernie have no lines in this special, but they still manage to get like one of the best jokes. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't feel that weird. It doesn't feel like they're not there at all. I think it's a good compromise if like they were, they probably couldn't get Steve that long. For all we know, Muppets Tonight was filming at the same time. That's true. And for all we know, they shot that Kermit insert like on the set of Muppets on, tonight on, on the set of Muppets know. tonight or something. Yeah, they very you know, well I mean, could have. Yeah. But here we also see Maria trying to consult Big Bird, who breaks down now in tears, realizing he may never see Snuffy again. Nobody. And Luis is over boarding up the fix it shop. They're officially out of business, which is fun for a story. But come on, y'all. I've worked at Christmas many times in my lifetime. I haven't, but I've only ever been a teacher, so. Okay. Yeah, I was yep. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> no, I am married to a teacher, so. Yeah, no. We work at public schools. <laughs> we get off for Christmas. <laughs> right. I worked at a TV station for over a decade, and most of those years included working on Christmas Day. Someone's got to be in that control room running It's a Wonderful Life on a loop. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But for the sake of the story, the demise of the fix-it shop and Big Bird being distraught about never seeing his best friend again is enough to make Elmo finally realize he's made a huge mistake. And he repeats Santa's song about how every day can't be Christmas. And then, 11 years later, Oscar the Grouch sees this when the (laughs) ghost of Christmas present shows into him. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) But Oscar the Grouch is there. And Oscar is very adamant that it should be Christmas every day. Yes. Oscar is like in a weirdly almost uncharacteristic. Like I get that Oscar is grumpy and all of those things, but like yeah. this almost feels kind of antagonistic in a way. It does. It's more selfish than we're used to seeing from Oscar. Yeah, and like okay, well I won't get ahead. No, yeah, yeah. The, the final straw here comes as Santa shows up in casual wear, big bag of golf clubs, to tell Lightning in person that he's retiring and moving to Florida, which was okay to do in 1996. <laughs> yeah. I live here, I I know. Yeah, no, I... <laughs> he's too old to carry heavy bags of toys every night, every night of the year. And besides that, no one seems to care that much about Christmas anymore. So he heads out, but not before Elmo asks, well, what should he do about Christmas every day? And Santa wishes he could help him, but he doesn't have a wish. Oh, if only somebody had a wish. And Charles Durning turns and winks at us for the longest (laughs) two seconds of my life. The worst wink. (laughs) Just imagine the longest knowing wink to the camera you've ever seen on TV, and this is longer. It's yes, 
wing, winking is hard to do for what it's worth. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. But Charles Durning, great actor. Seems like a seems like he was, you know, a, a, a nice man, although I guess I don't know much about him. So I hope I'm not the, talking about someone who was canceled or whatever. The man stormed Omaha Beach on D-Day. Yeah. My OK, friend. there we go. All right. That'll do. Um, I appreciate that he did that. Um, <laughs> D-Day was important, <laughs> but um, <laughs> he, he certainly is not good at winking. Nope. <laughs> we can't all have all the talents. And Elmo doesn't remember right away that he still has one wish left on his magic snow globe. But Lightning remembers, and Elmo excitedly takes the snow globe out of his backpack and calls everyone over to tell him he knows how to fix Christmas. And the first person I see to show up when Elmo calls everyone out is Oscar's longtime girlfriend, Grungetta. Yeah. Again, Great. no lines here. I'm just happy to see Grungetta. She- yeah, yeah. She does kind of like angrily, like when Oscar is like, don't wish for it back. She's kind of like, she's also with Oscar. She also wants it to be Christmas every day. No, she likes this. Listen to (laughs) Oski. Yeah, there you go. But everyone gathers around. Elmo explains to them he's the one who wished for Christmas every day to a resounding what? But he knows how to fix it. So Elmo says he's going to wish for Christmas to go back to being once a year. And he shakes the snow globe, goes wish, 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 wish. But before he can say Blitzen, the snow globe slips out of his hands and crashes onto the ground. And I am not too proud to admit I audibly gasped when that happened. It broke my little heart. (laughs) It's just like the end of Walt Disney's Cinderella. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. When the slipper breaks before Cinderella can try it on. But fortunately, she had the other one. I have the other snow globe. <laughs> right. Just like Walt Disney's Cinderella, this has a sad ending at this point, right? That's, that's yeah, it. They both, the they both have sad endings. Yes. <laughs> I never watched past the break. No. It was too <laughs> distraught. Like the shoe's broken. I, I, can't, I can't go on. I can't finish this. <laughs> so everyone else walks away, too, even more upset than before. And Elmo wonders, well, now what? To which Lightning replies, he doesn't know. All he knows how to do is pull a sleigh. And that gives Elmo an idea. If Lightning is fast enough to take Elmo forward in time, he can also take him back in time. So in order to save Christmas, Elmo and Lightning are going to do a Superman the movie. (laughs) So I do just want to say it's Christmas magic, but also like, no, that logic doesn't work. <laughs> it is much easier to go forward in time. Than oh, yeah. In time. We're all traveling forward in time right now. We're doing it right now. Yes. Even a child can do it. But. But lightning can apparently fly backwards around the globe as fast as they can to reverse time for an entire year. Yeah, Superman only does it for like a it's not even a day. Yeah, no, it's, it's like, a few yeah, minutes. It's a little bit of time, yeah. Just to get Lois out of the ground. And Superman is like exerting him. Superman is like, Christopher Reeve is like wailing, like gnashing his teeth. It's like he's yeah. like exerting all of his <laughs> effort to do this for a few minutes. And Lightning's just like, sure, Elmo, I can do that. Like <laughs> <laughs> This whole time, Lightning was the Flash. That's where he gets his name from, yeah. not Blitzen. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That's right. I remember when Brad Meltzer wrote a 12 issue miniseries about lightning. <laughs> <laughs> so Elmo arrives back at Christmas Eve night. He's back in his polka dot pajamas even and helping Santa out of the chimney. Yeah. At first, I wasn't sure how they were going to tie up the time travel shenanigans. Were they going to have Elmo meet up or avoid his past self here? But no, it looks like he's just replaced himself at the time where he was, pulling Santa out of the chimney, but with the knowledge of what has happened. Well, to be fair, they don't address the fact that Elmo should be on Sesame Street and all of the other. And I guess not. Yeah, I don't know. So I think that Elmo left, right? So when he left Sesame Street the day after the original Christmas, he's gone. Okay. He's gone because he's in the sleigh. Okay, sure. Yeah. That's it. Right? So he's just not there and nobody notices or cares. Sure. Okay. (laughs) Works for me. Well, his his dad's fighting. fighting Dad's fighting in Iraq. You know, his dad is kind of like the Charles Durning of today. (laughs) Yeah, true. Exactly. (laughs) For you. 
<laughs> so it all fits together. Wibbly wobbly. He, and also, his dad can't wink either, but that's because of functioning <laughs> eyes. <laughs> What did Charles Durning and Elmo's father have in common? No functioning eyelids. <laughs> and a purple heart. Yes. <laughs> but yes, Elmo has the memory of it being Christmas every day in another timeline. And so does Lightning, who is back inside Santa's sack again somehow. He just flew back in time and rewound himself back in there. Whispers to Elmo, you saved Christmas, Elmo. <laughs> and Santa adds, that's right, you did save Christmas. And he says the same line he did before. Again, Santa gives Elmo the choice between the magic snow globe and the pink teddy bear, which he suggested earlier that this has happened before. I wonder how many others who received magic wishing globes learned their lesson the first time like Elmo did. Good question, yeah. I feel like what with what the elf said and this... And Santa also seems to kind of know right. what happened. I think maybe it's suggested that this has happened before. Time is a flat circle. You know, like that Santa has given many children the snow globe and they've all wished that Christmas could be every day and then had to undo that wish. And no one learns any lessons, including Santa. No. Right. But Elmo wisely chooses the pink bear this time. He did really like it the first time. But now he definitely knows Santa was aware of what's happened because this time he offers Elmo a moo bunny, which Elmo happily accepts. <laughs> yeah, I know that rules. Of course. Yeah, I would. I would definitely want that moo bunny. Yeah. So Elmo saves Christmas by first ruining it. And for Lightning's part in saving Christmas, Santa tells him he can sit up front and learn how to be one of his reindeer, and maybe someday he'll soon lead the team. I hope he does. So Santa heads back up the chimney, and Elmo goes to his window to watch him take off, and that, Maya Angelou concludes the story, is how Elmo saved Christmas. But wait. But wait. She tells her friends that while we can't have Christmas every day, we can still keep the spirit of Christmas alive all year long in our heart. And that's the cue for an old favorite, keep Christmas with you all through the year. All through the year. You're doing a Sesame Street Christmas special. You've got to sing keep Christmas with you. They have to. It's a great version, though. I really love it. I do like this version. It is. It is. A couple of weird things, though, worth noting real mm -hmm. quick. So like I said, it, I don't remember if I said this on mic or if I said this before, but Zoe, Baby Bear, and Telly catch up with the story yes. here. It's like how Gonzo and Rizzo at the end of Muppet Christmas Carol are suddenly part of the story of Muppet Christmas Carol. But Zoe, Baby Bear, and Telly come out to sing Keep Christmas With You with mm -hmm. the cast, which also includes, again, Forgetful Jones uh, and... Uh, Harry. Three of my favorites, Humphrey and Ingrid and baby Natasha. Yep, they're there. Um, featured very prominently. I also want to note, again, because I'm required to talk about this stuff, but the song starts with Bob and Prairie Dawn decorating the Christmas tree. Yes. Weirdly, for a while, Prairie Dawn is like the only Muppet band. Yeah. It's like Bob and the kids and Prairie Dawn, but also... Bob lifts Prairie Dawn up so she can put an ornament on the tree and it's very cute. But then Bob starts holding Prairie Dawn like an infant. Like and an it infant. was kind of creepy because again, like, no, I don't know. It was weird. <laughs> I, I did point that out. I'm like, what what is happening here? You don't I I don't even hold my children like that when they're putting stuff on a tree. Yeah, I was gonna say she's not. She's not an infant. No. <laughs> this woman this woman directs plays. Regularly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like she's not <laughs> to be cradled in your arms, Bob. <laughs> but um but yeah, so but otherwise it's a good performance. I mean, obviously nothing is going to be as good as the original, but No, you know, of course not. It's a good performance of the song weird moments aside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And of course, I said Bob's name derisively a second ago, but of course, Bob McGrath, a legend by oh. all accounts, a very oh, yeah. sweet man, recently yes. passed away. R.I.P. Bob, we love him, of course. Mm -hmm. 
Glad he was there right at the end here. Glad Prairie Dawn was right here at the end there. Things are wrapping up, but wait, there's one more loose end to tie up. Snuffy's home. Yeah, he's wearing that hat still. Sure is. Wear the hat still, but wait a minute, it's still Christmas. What's he doing here? And he explains to Bird this year his granny came to visit him. <laughs> I sure hope Snuffy's parents, before he went to the airport, told Snuffy that granny was coming to visit them. Yeah, uh, but you know what? I can see a kid, you know, Snuffy's young. I can see a kid, like, not understanding that plans had changed. Yeah, that's true. When it was made obvious to him repeatedly. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can definitely see that happening. Yeah, I, you two are parents, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so now, Happy Snuffy and Big Bird are back together. Everyone sings us out to the end of Keep Christmas With You. And that is it. And that was lovely. Well, and it, we should note it does end with... Yes! After the closing credits, we get one more clip from It's a Wonderful Life. And it's the thing where Zuzu points at the tree and says, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets to swing. Mm -hmm. And I think we see George say, that's right, that a boy Clarence or something. That a boy yeah. Clarence, we do see that. We do. We get the VN title card from It's a Wonderful Life. From It's a Wonderful Life, yeah. Yeah, that rules. That makes me so happy. Yeah. Like, that's at the end of the credits of this. They end, it's it's the same title card, but it's on yeah. Elmo's TV, which I like. Or it might be the Fix-It yeah. Shop TV. It's the, yeah, it, yeah. Well, any final thoughts on Elmo Saves Christmas? It's cute. Uh, I'd say it's probably the second best Sesame Street Christmas special. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think it has to be. Yeah. I like Elmo's Christmas Countdown more than some people do. Um, I think I would probably put that third. But Yeah, no, that I mean, that has some good moments. I won't argue with that. They want to snuffle up, I guess, for Christmas. That yes, I don't, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Anne Hathaway is adorable in that song, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, but uh, this one, like I said, I, I watch it every year. I've always really liked it. It's funnier than it needs to be. As I, like we talked about, you know, we kept like we all kept saying, that's a good joke. That's a great joke. Yeah. And the Elmo Christmas special from 1996 could have not been full of great jokes, you know, and I'm so glad that it is. It's one of those things where I don't know that I think of 1996 as the golden age of Sesame Street, but. It, this is evidence that the show was still very strong, much stronger than it is today. Oh, yeah. And uh, it just it's a, it's a joy. And it's it's May when we're recording this. And this is maybe the best Christmas special to watch in May. True. You know, because yeah, that's true. Because Harvey Firestein might show up. <laughs> that's right. He might come over here and sell me an egg. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, other than that, I don't know. Thanks for having us, Mike. What a joy. What fun. Thank you. Yeah, no. Listen, listen. I'm always, always love talking 90s Sesame Street. I agree with Anthony that 90s is not the best era of Sesame Street. It's definitely the 70s. We all know it's the 70s. Oh, yeah. But uh, I always will have a lot of nostalgia for this era, even if I don't have a lot of nostalgia for this particular special. And, you know, watching it, I listen. I really enjoy this special. Uh, I think I'm going to watch it more often because I think I could really use to keep Christmas with me, you know, all through the year. <laughs> sure. There you go. This was a fun revisit. It had been a while for me, but this might also be my second favorite Sesame Street Christmas special. I, I can definitely it's not going to top Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. That's no, that's my no. ride or die that or get flung down multiple flights of stairs and we should we should all clarify that we are not including muppet family christmas right a christmas special with with the sesame street characters in it because that's the most perfect thing ever made by human uh, yeah inarguably uh, my number one. Oh yes yes it's my favorite muppet thing no question there's there's no oh yeah i think it's nope the we like we we mentioned my podcast uh earlier moving right along a podcast where we watch Muppet movies two minutes at a time. We do special episodes, bonus episodes devoted to a special sometimes. Muppet Family Christmas, we did it two minutes at a time. We didn't you do did. a bonus episode. We did, the did whole a thing. bonus season because we were so excited. You did a whole bonus season just in one month. You were releasing episodes every day for the month of December. Yeah. 
Yes, we released uh, daily episodes December 1st through 24th. And they were uh, they were pretty short. They were like 20 minutes each. So actually, if, if listeners wanted to try our show out, that might that might be the place to start. Because the episodes are shorter, they're breezier and kind of silly. This is a show that releases only in one month every other day. So they're familiar with how that goes. So it's perfect. Right. Yeah, yeah. But thank you both so, so much for joining me on this journey into the future and back again. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Wait, Becca, did you plug Hubba You didn't. No, right? I didn't. Well, I'm about to. If people want to offer you the choice between a cute, harmless stuffed animal or a timeline altering monkey paw snow globe, where can they find you on the Internet, Becca? Yeah. So let's start. Uh, so obviously, like I said, the best place to find me is toughpigs.com. Um, which you can access anywhere on the internet at toughpigs.com or Twitter, um, Facebook, Instagram, all of those things. Um, I write for Tough Pigs. I do art for Tough Pigs. I design shirts for Tough Pigs. I, I'm i trying to, trying to do a lot more for Tough Pigs lately. But also, like Anthony said, one cool thing that I do on Tough Pigs is I host a podcast called Hubba which is a uh, Muppet trivia podcast, Muppet and Henson trivia podcast. Uh, there's two seasons of Hubble Wa out now, including an episode focused on um, Christmas specials, uh, an episode mm-hmm. focused on classic Christmas specials and a Thanksgiving themed episode. I don't know if <laughs> yes, Thanksgiving right. is Thanksgiving is part of your show or not. It is. But um, both those and season three will be coming soon. Um. And, uh, yeah, you can find me personally. Um, unfortunately, Twitter is still the best place to find me, uh, <laughs> at uncle Petunio. That's uncle. Like, I don't know. Um, uh, I always have a joke for this deadly. Yeah. Like uncle deadly. And then Petunio, uh, is like the flower, but with an O instead of the A. And Anthony. Well, I'm mostly off of social media in my personal life these days, uh, other than like personal life. In my, in my public life, I guess I'm mostly off of Sure. Uh, but you can find me at toughpigs.com. I'm not writing for the site as much as I used to. Um, I do co-host Moving Right Along podcast, as we already discussed. And we just finished Muppet Christmas Carol, like I think Mike said earlier in the show. We finished that in May. And that's 44 episodes about a Muppet movie set at Christmas time. And if I, I can toot our own horn, it's me and our. Uh, Absolutely. Our, it's me and my co-host, Ryan Rowe, who is one of the site runners on Tough Pigs. I mean, he's he's much more important to the site at large than I am. Uh, but we we host the show together. And if I can toot our own horn for a little bit, our guests during the Muppet Christmas Carol season Included Paul Williams, yeah, Dave Goals, who plays who plays Gonzo and Bunsen Honeydew and a lot of other characters, and Meredith Braun, who plays Meredith Belle Braun. In, in the movie, yeah, and get, gets to sing "When Love Is Gone." So we got to talk to her about that and about the song being restored and all that. So I love having our friends on the show. Don't get me wrong, I do. Uh, uh, Becca's been on every season, and it's always a thrill. For example, uh, but it was really fun this year to have people involved in the movie and get to talk to them about the movie. So. Uh, if you're interested in Muppet Christmas Carol, I would definitely recommend checking out our podcast. I can't stress enough. Uh, moving right along is probably my favorite podcast. Uh, so, um, I mean, well, you've, been, you've you've been on it eight times, so yeah. Uh, well, uh, it's my favorite podcast after JD's podcast. Um, my second favorite uh, podcast, <laughs> but um, that's another uh, Tough Pigs podcast. That's a good one. It's a great podcast. You know, if you're thinking. How is there possibly enough interesting things to say about two minutes at a time? Oh, there is. And, oh, there is. And uh, and Anthony and Ryan do a great job keeping it interesting. Uh, they're really good at choosing good guests. You know, for instance, I'm on it like eight times, <laughs> which is a great. Twice every movie so far. Twice yeah. every movie. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk about my least favorite Muppet movie next. But um <laughs> <laughs> it's hey it's, hey hey, Be- hey becca mm-hmm. we have the same least favorite muppet movie and i'm gonna be on 50 episodes you are <laughs> make it a hat trick yo you're not you're, you're not a treasure island guy either am i it's not that i'm it's like 
you have to have one at the bottom. Yeah. And Treasure yeah. Island just happens to be the one at the bottom. Yeah, exactly. Sure. I mean, I don't despise it, but yeah, yeah, I um, agree. I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm and and I and I sure hope I don't spend fifty episodes being like, mm, this movie's not as funny as I like things to be. <laughs> I don't want to be like that the whole time. But yeah, so definitely, you know, if you're and certainly again, your audience loves Christmas. That yep. Christmas Carol season is great. Anthony brings in a lot of history, both, um, uh, you know, about Dickens and about Christmas traditions. And yes, you got my annotated Christmas yep. Carol right here. So. There it is. There it is. Yes. And I cannot recommend all of those links enough. Please go treat yourselves. You can find those links in the show notes of this episode. You can find this in every episode of the Advent Calendar House very conveniently at adventcalendar.house. Uh, and all of my social whatevers are there as well, so you can say hi to me there. Thank you all for listening. Tune in next time in just a couple of days to see what else I can drum up. Until then, for Becca Petunia and Anthony Strand, from around the corner while it still exists, this is Mike Westfall reminding you to be careful of the icy patch and keep Christmas with you all through the year, but not literally. Good night. Next time on the Advent Calendar House. The classic tale of the little drummer boy continues. There is more, my son, for this is only the beginning. The little drummer boy joins the wise king on a journey to ring the Christmas bells. Now! But the bells are stolen by evil soldiers, and the little drummer boy must risk all to save them. No, please!